scientific revolution. Here, these are the dates people usually give as the start date and the ending date. You could say, you could argue that it started earlier and then continued on after. But here's, generally speaking, where uh, what people talk about when they say this, the scientific revolution, okay? And this was the beginning of things like biology and chemistry, okay? Uh, physics, especially. We talked about the founders of these things, the Newton, the founder of physics, Boyle, one of the founders of chemistry. We talked about several people. Newton's the founder of calculus. That as well, yes. Uh, but he was also the founder of physics. That's right, he was. Uh, but here, the main point that, we, that I wanted to get across is that all of these, or most of these men, were had faith in God, and they didn't view uh, their faith and science to be in conflict. And so the question was posed, when did that kind of viewpoint arise? When did it become popular to think that the two were opposing forces that could never get along? Because that's certainly what we're told today. That's certainly the kind of the storyline that gets thrown out there. Okay, so it wasn't back then, I'll tell you right now as we looked at. But there was a period of time right after this, in fact, there's a little bit of an overlap, as you can see, it started about 1685, as people call it, something called the Enlightenment, okay? I remember that. Have you heard of this? What is the Enlightenment? Uh, we learned about it in history, isn't it, where everybody started, uh, like religion started booming a lot? And uh, the church. You're probably thinking of the Reformation, uh, or, the, or the Restoration, both of those. Uh, those were great moments in history, but not quite the same. Okay. Somebody read that for me. Philosophical movement centered around the idea that reason is the primary source of authority and legitimacy. It advocated such ideas as liberty, progress, tolerance, constitutional government, government, and separation of church and state. All right, so this is what people call the Enlightenment. This was a movement, again, in Western Europe. It kind of stemmed as an aftermath of science, where people thought, you know what, I'm no, I'm a, I'm no longer going to listen to kind of these governmental churches, right? This was back, back when the church and government were basically one and the same, and you had state religions in England and France and so on, and there became a, uh, uh, an idea that, you know what, government and church should be separate. And we need to be allowing people to have religious freedom. We need to uh, go for a constitutional government. You know what that means? Government based off the Constitution. Yeah, so. The regulations of the so that, yeah, the idea is that it's not based on a king, it's not based on a person, you know. Mm -hmm. Basically, before the idea of constitutional governments, uh, a new leader could come in and they could just change any law they wanted, right? Whereas a constitutional government, the idea behind that is that it's the people who change the, change the laws. It's the people who are in charge of, uh, who basically rule the government. Uh, you know, the, the, the country is for the people, by the people, right? Mm -hmm. So all of this came kind of at the same time. And you could say it was a product of, uh, a little bit of a product of the scientific revolution. And all of these are good things, right? All of these are good things. There's kind of a straw man that gets thrown out there on Christians that we just want the government to control religion, things like that. I, I think most Christians would completely disagree with that, right? I think most Christians would say, okay, this, these were good things, and uh, therefore, we, we as Christians, we as Christians, we don't want the government to just rule our lives uh, and rule religion. The, the idea of separation between church and state is well accepted at this point after the Enlightenment. Now what happens is a lot of times there's a revisionist history that goes on. Atheists will point back to the Enlightenment and basically try to claim that it, it happened because of atheism or because of people moving away from faith. That's not really accurate. They moved away from these state-run religions but they, most people at that point were still believers. The rise of materialism happened later. So what is materialism? Uh, it's when they believe in the physical world and not the spiritual world. 
Yeah, so we got to remember this. You might want to write this down on, on your paper. Uh, just because this, this term is going to come back over and over again, you can just write it on the bottom of the back sheet. Mm -hmm. Materialism is the doctrine that nothing exists except matter and its movements and modifications. Only matter exists. Only what is in the universe that we can observe exists. That's, that's, this doctrine it came after the Enlightenment. So it's disingenuous to say that, oh, atheism led to the Enlightenment, which led to better things and so on. It's actually more accurate to say that the Enlightenment was one of the things that birthed a rise of materialism later on. I'll have to finish that writing that one up. So this new atheistic worldview, materialism, it did arise again later. And here's kind of how it began. It started among philosophers, okay? It started among philosophers who were attacking the cosmological argument. Okay, so here's the cosmological argument once again. This is the argument we're talking about this unit, remember? So this argument, as I mentioned before, was formulated in the Middle Ages. And so by the time the scientific revolution came around, this argument had already been uh, a part of you know, intellectual thinking. It had been accepted by most. It was a very popular argument. And even into the Enlightenment, this argument was well known. But what we have in the Enlightenment, uh, really and after the Enlightenment, are some philosophers who started poking holes in this argument. They said, no, 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 this, this argument is not valid, it has problems. Okay? Well, the first one, or at least the main one, that gets a lot of credit for this is a guy named Immanuel Kant. He, as you can see, was born uh, 1724. This is right there, kind of in, in the tail end of the Enlightenment. <clears throat> he started to attack the cosmological argument. And the way he did it was he, he argued that when it comes to this argument, the second premise, he said, is false, or at least, at the very least, cannot be proven. And at that time, uh, well, actually, let me ask you. Do you think he was right about that? Yeah. Why? Wait, what? Oh, okay. All right, let me rephrase. What? Immanuel Kant, he said, you know what, this argument, it doesn't hold water, it's, it's flawed, because so the second premise, the idea that the universe had a beginning, is false. Or at least, it cannot be proven. So let me ask you, can this premise be proven? Yeah, it can be proven. Okay, but could it be proven back then? No. Wow. Uh, no, not really. Not really. Well, so here's the thing. Here's we need to understand that there, this argument, though it was very strong back in uh, the Middle Ages when it was formulated, even up until the into the Enlightenment and post, even though it was strong, it did have a major flaw, and that was that the evidence we just didn't have enough evidence to prove premise number two. We had zero evidence, really, uh, of either or. Yes? You know what's neat? Is that when we didn't have enough evidence to prove those, a lot of the world was Christian, and now a lot of the world isn't Christian, and now we have all the evidence to prove it. I know, it's sad, isn't it? It's kind of weird, right? We'll talk about that, yeah. So, remember in your worksheets, uh, there was one I gave you a couple of, like the last week, 3-3, uh, I think it was, where it says there's only two options. Oh, okay. okay, so you remember that? The idea was that we have really only two options as to the origins of the universe. Either nothing... Oh. What was it? You guys remember? Nothing is unmade. Nothing created anything. Yeah, either nothing created everything or... So or Something is what? Unmade. Unmade or eternal, right? So, these are the only two options. This was well understood by philosophers and uh, early scientists 
intellectuals uh, just for many, many years this has been well understood. And most agree at this point in time that the idea that nothing create, created anything is, is logically unsound, it doesn't work, it's foolhardy. So most people agreed, okay, that doesn't work. What Kant pointed out, and uh, several other philosophers, is really that they, they agreed, yes, this is true, you only have these two options, but they said, why does that mean there has to be a God? They came up with a conclusion that, you know what, uh, they said, you know what, what, what about the universe? Why is that not eternal? Why is that not unmade? So they were, they were saying, you can't prove that the universe had a beginning. Therefore, the universe is unmade, which alleviates us of having to believe in God. At least that's how they viewed it, right? They said, oh, we don't have to believe in God because the universe, in essence, takes his place. Uh, and that way you can still be a materialist. You can still... Uh, you know, live your life however you want, really, uh, if you believe that the universe is eternal rather than there being a God. Okay, so this is a very important concept because as we, uh, as we go through the rest of history, we're going to see in the 19th century, or really the 20th century, which is the 1900s, we're going to see that evidence popped up which was just missing for a long, long time. We now have evidence to show that premise number two is correct. Which means there's really been a resurgence in the cosmological argument. Kant and, and other philosophers, they poked holes in it and they said, and, and so plenty of atheists were completely unconvinced by this argument because they thought, you know what, the universe is eternal. It had no beginning. Okay, what we're gonna look at over the next uh, few classes is the actual evidence that the universe did have a beginning. Okay, so that's a very important concept. But Kant was successful in making the cosmological argument fall out of favor among intellectuals. So people no longer agreed with this argument. They no longer thought it had strength. But they also went after other arguments, like the design argument. You guys remember the metaphor of the clock? Talked about yesterday. Uh, Boyle was the guy who famously put it. He said, the universe is like a watch or a clock that's been, every gear has been made to work together and it's, it's as if the clock has been wound and set aside and everything works, uh, everything in the universe kind of functions together, interacts with one another and all to very specific designs. And so his, his metaphor or his argument was that the universe is too well designed to be uh, to have come out of nothing or to, uh, or to not have come from an intelligent designer, right? So this was his argument for intelligent design. We'll definitely talk more about that argument uh, as we get into the next quarter. But uh, here's another philosopher named David Hume. He took aim at the design argument, and uh, he, among others, started to poke holes in this argument. Yes? So what's right this one down? Or what's this? Which philosophers are you going to sort down? I'll tell you. Because I already wrote that one down, but I don't know. Oh, uh, don't, yeah, these are not the three men. Sorry. Then, I'll let you know when we get to the three men. The three thinkers. You can write these notes down, that'd be helpful, but yeah. these are not the three thinkers. So Hume, he said, this whole clock idea that Boyle presented, he said this is a faulty analogy. Remember that in our logical fallacies? Yes, when they compare two things that aren't the same. When you compare two things that aren't the same, not the same or at least level. on uh, yeah, they're in fundamental, important ways, they're not the same. And it's uh, basically when you're when you're only comparing superficial things. Okay, so he said, you know what, the clock and biology, life, you know, the organisms that breed and reproduce. He said those are two very different things. It's a faulty analogy, and his main argument for it being a faulty analogy was, he said, eyes and watches both depend upon uh, functional integration of many separate and specifically configured parts. That was the point of Boyle. But he said, biological organisms also differ from human artifacts. They reproduce themselves. 
And, the, uh, and so he said, you can't compare a clock and organisms, because organisms, we reproduce. We create new life. So he said, that's a faulty analogy. Now here's my question to you guys. Do you agree with that assessment? Yeah, it's it's like read. Yeah. It reads. No, no, no. Yeah. That's what I was gonna say. No, not yeah. like it's like it doesn't change. It just doesn't make the same. Well say say that okay. false again. Sorry? Say say again, why Okay, here's here's the thing. When it comes to something being a faulty analogy. What that generally means is that you're comparing two things to argue for a point, but you're not proving your point because the two things are too different. Okay, And that was what Hume was saying about the clock argument. Now here was what Boyle was comparing. He said a clock has gears that work together. In other words, they interact with each other, they react to one another, and that's what keeps the order to the clock, right? That's what keeps the time. The gears work together without being manipulated. In other words, a clock uh, would not, a clock would be useless if somebody had to sit there and make each second timer go, right? A clock has to work on its own. So Boyle was saying the universe is like that too. Everything in the universe, uh, gravity, which makes the planets orbit around suns, and and uh, all of the things in chemistry we see, you know, uh, atoms, which they hadn't known too, they didn't know too much about at that point, uh, but especially in chemistry with you know what makes water, hydrogen, hydrogen and oxygen, right? Two parts hydrogen, one part, one part oxygen. oxygen. The idea that everything interacts like, uh, like that and works together without manipulation was his point. In other words, what would be manipulation? Uh, to the by the maker. Yeah, this would, that would mean God is coming in and like making things happen, and the only thing that can happen in the universe is when he's intervening, right? Put it on autopilot. Sorry? It's, it's like put something on autopilot. Yeah, so, exactly. So, in other words, his point about the clock was that the universe was so well designed that everything works together, okay? Hume says this is a bad argument because in life, you, uh, you have biological organisms, they reproduce, and mm -hmm. clocks don't reproduce. That's a, well, that's a dumb what about um, water and matter? We can't ever make more matter than there has been in the world. Okay, so here's one problem with Hume's argument. He's zooming in on one facet of creation, right, of the universe. So maybe, just to be fair to Hume, you could say, okay, the clock argument doesn't work for biology, but it could work for everything else in life. Okay? Uh, you were saying that's a dumb refutation. Why do you think so? Because it's like, um... I can't really phrase the first though. It means like today is like one of Okay, uh, so yeah. a lot of people agree with you. Here is one of the responses from a, from someone who liked the clock argument though. And I'm not saying that you have to agree that the clock argument is the best argument ever. But here's uh, one thing that somebody said. You're right. Biological organisms do reproduce. Clocks don't. If we were to find a clock that reproduced, we would be extremely amazed by it, wouldn't we? It says, I'm extremely amazed by the intricate workings of the universe and how life on the universe reproduces. And it's like, the fact that organisms are even more complex and even more mysterious and wonderful doesn't disprove the argument, it just shows that, it, uh, that the design is even more spectacular, right? So that was the response. You can agree, you can disagree, but uh, I think that was a pretty good response. 
And I think the point the, that we can't lose from this, uh, from the, we need to understand, he's not trying to prove everything by using the clock argument. Yeah, he's he's to just, trying to, just trying to argue for the mechanisms working together on their own. That's the whole point of the clock metaphor. Okay. So there were attacks on the cosmological argument. There were attacks on the design argument. So this meant that over time, scientists stopped, they started looking for other explanations. They started looking for other arguments. And they, they started being more skeptical as to whether or not there was a God, okay? And then, that, thus we enter in three, uh, three thinkers, three men who popularized materialism, okay? So the materialistic movement, I, I believe, had already arisen up to this point, but there were three figures in history that really made it popular, okay? Really made it popular among intellectuals and scientists and philosophers. Okay, here's the first one. You're right, Charles Darwin. Let's go. All right, write him down. Charles Darwin. What is he famous for? Evolution theory. The theory of evolution? The father of evolution. Father of it? That's the basis of standard textbooks in public school. Oh, is that what it said? Yeah. Okay. All right, let's talk about Charles Darwin for a second. What is the, what is the theory that he proposed that he put out there? Uh, everything is made from a single cell. Yeah, everything everything in life has a common ancestor. That was the idea. Okay. In other words, it started with a single cell organism, and that branched out. And, you know, maybe there were more than one single cell organisms, but the idea is that it branched out. And every organism has common ancestry. And that, of course, led to the theory that humanity is evolved from ape-like creatures, uh, which were evolved from crustacean-like creatures, and so on. Okay, So this was the big materialistic explanation for where we came from. Okay. There were a lot of other uh, materialistic explanations that were coming out that were very popular, like about uh, just the origins of the Earth and how gravity could have formed the Earth and so on and so forth. But the big one that made it popular was that this explained life, right? This explained why the complexities of life. And as Charles Darwin put it, this explained why things only appeared to be designed. Right? Usually the design argument was, well, look at all the, look at how complex life is. There has to be an intelligent designer. That was the argument. Well, da what Darwin did was he said, no, 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 it only looks like it's been designed. And that was the, so you're going to hear a lot of new atheists, new age atheists. They're going to use this phrase, apparent design. And it really annoys me when they say this, because they, in my opinion, apparent design would be evidence of design, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. They say, but this, you know, this theory of evolution gives them a way that they can kind of skirt around that. Oh, oh yeah, it looks designed. It looks like a, an intelligent mind created it, but that's the power of evolution. It just, it makes things look designed, okay? So here's a, an important quote from a, uh, a biologist, Francisco Ayala. 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 Here's what he said. The functional design of organisms and their features would seem to argue for the existence of a designer. It was Darwin's greatest accomplishment, however, to show that the directive organization of living beings can be explained as the result of a natural process, natural selection, without any need to resort to a creator or other external agent. Okay? So, he, so Darwin really popularized... And, and presented an explanation for where we came from that didn't have the we in, in which we didn't need God. Okay, so what is natural selection? Just real quick. Uh, the weak ones die, and the other ones live more. So it's kind of survival of the fittest. Mm -hmm. uh, the example I always use is in a snowy tundra. 
there are, let's say, five rabbits are born in a snowy tundra. Three of them are white, two of them are brown. In a snowy tundra, which colored rabbit is most likely to be found by a wolf? Brown. Brown, brown one. So do they survive long? Brown. No. So this is the idea, the basic idea of natural selection. Those white rabbits are more likely to have white babies, okay, and so on. So the idea is that over time, organisms change. And by the way, that, that whole concept is very much verified in science. It's true. And, that, and we as Christians don't even have any problem with that idea. What Darwin did was he took that and he drew it out over a long period of time, and he, he used it to connect all, organi all, all organisms and said, we all come from common ancestry. When we get into the next unit, we'll talk about how that's a giant leap, okay, from one to the other. We call it uh, microevolution versus macroevolution. Micro being small, macro being big. Okay, microevolution is very much verified in science. That's why we are able to make different breeds of dogs. Okay, mm -hmm. but that's you. You can't take that evidence. You can't take evidence for microevolution and use it to say, oh yeah, we're all of the same in the same family tree. And we'll talk about why that doesn't quite work. You can't breed a dog into a fish. Exactly, uh, but we'll, we'll get into we'll get into more detail about that in the next in the next uh, quarter or the next unit. But we need to understand Darwin comes out with this theory. It kind of explodes on the scene. Yes, there are some critics. There are people who don't like it. Darwin was uh, he was kind of the first scientist to discredit his opponents, especially those who believe in an intelligent designer by saying they're not really scientists. He was kind of the first to argue uh, that any explanation that involves God is not a scientific explanation. In fact, uh, you can quote him as saying that to one of his particular critics who was talking about the plan of creation. And Darwin said, plan of creation? That is not a scientific explanation. That's, and this has become very popular among scientists today, right? So I. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard scientists just say straight out, creationism is not science. And what they mean is anyone who believe who, who, who tries to present evidence that there's a creator, they need they can be discredited immediately because they're not sci they're not using science. So, so Darwin was kind of the first to really popularize this really the start of the idea that science and religion were butting heads, that they were opposing forces. He's the one that really popularized it. So we have a lot to think for when it comes to Torah. Uh, we'll talk more about him, of course. But let's talk about the next guy, okay? Karl Marx. He, oh, is, he is somewhat less relevant today uh, than Darwin. Yes, as well as the war. But we'll talk about that in a second. Karl Marx, what is he famous for? Communism. Communism, okay. Uh, let's be more specific. Marxism. Marxism, Marxism. yeah. Marxism. Okay. So, Marxism, what is Marxism? Communism. Somebody give me an actual explanation now. What is Marxism? Uh, what the ideology is like? Yeah, what is the ideology of Marxism? Distribution of wealth, no religion. Yeah. Somebody else? Yeah. Okay, so Marxism, so if Darwin told everybody, gave everyone a materialist explanation as to where we came from, think of Marxism, uh, Marx as giving, giving everyone a materialist explanation of where we're going. Okay, he, he was pointing to a future utopia. What's a utopia? Yeah, perfect per society. Perfect society. A perfect society. He said one day we're going to reach this perfect society. And you know, and it, it was. Well, we we might talk about that later, but uh, the reason why he let, let me start off for just for a second. Okay. Marx, his theories became very popular in Western Europe. Became very popular throughout Europe and Asia. Okay, uh, by Asia I mean Russia. Okay. His viewpoints among intellectuals were, oh, this is the great materialist explanation of where we're headed, right? We no longer need to worry. This was like a replacement of heaven, 
so to speak. Okay, we're going toward this future utopian vision, and we're uh, what we need to do in order to get there is uh, re, re you know re repossess people's wealth and distribute it and so on and so forth. And of, of course, what that led to was millions and millions and millions of deaths. Okay, so no no beating around the bush, no pretending that Marx was a you know, a visionary and... Yeah, you like Right. Nope. I don't know about that. Well, I told this story. I don't need your help right now. I know you're very opinion. I agree with you. But, just let me say it, okay? We need to be very clear. Marx was not a good guy. He was, it's not like his views uh, were just not actually tried, okay? They were tried, and they, and the consequence of that was the death of hundreds of millions of people, okay, in the 20th century. Which is why he's become less popular today, uh, as he should be. But there are still people who would, uh, who like him, and I just want to dissuade you of that right now. There's a book I would recommend everyone read, I think everybody should read it in school, okay? I've told you about it, yeah. It's called uh, the Gulag Archipelago. Mm. Anybody heard of it? Yeah. You heard of it? Okay. Yeah. I might have talked about it. I can't remember. Uh, this is a book that used to be kind of required reading, uh, but it's not anymore. It's by a guy named Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and he was a survivor of the Gulag in the Soviet Union. Do you know what the Gulag is? Yeah. It's, a, it's like basically the Holocaust of the Soviet Union. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> And in yes. Call of Duty? Okay. Work with parents where people would be slave, pretty much turned into slaves. Okay, so, yes, Call of Duty is a little inaccurate, okay? Uh, but I know, I've played that too. Okay, so, you're right. The Gulag were the slave camps, okay? And people were starved, they were uh, executed, they were worked to death in freezing conditions without clothes. The worst things you can possibly imagine, they happen in the Gulag, okay? Millions and millions of, of Soviet people died in the Gulags, okay? Solzhenitsyn was a guy who actually went to the camps for several years and survived. And what he did was he wrote a book, okay? And here's what's really amazing about what he did. In the Gulag, he didn't have paper. He didn't have pens, you know, they're, they're in horrible conditions, they're being tortured, they're all sorts of things. And what he did was he had uh, somebody fashion little rocks into kind of a bead of necklace, a necklace of beads. And every like fifth bead was a square or a cube. And every one in between was more like a sphere. And what he did was he used this to memorize like long, like, like basically memorize a book in his head. Because he had the time, because <laughs> he, uh, he was in, you know, the gulag yeah, for so long. So, you know what a rosary is? Yeah. So, do you know why how they use it? Don't they, like, pray every bead or something? Yeah, they have a certain line of prayer that they say with each bead. Oh. So, the bead helps you remember where you are in the prayer. Well, what he did was he took that and made it, he expanded it. And what he did was he made his own, and he went through, and, like, every ten lines was the first one, another ten lines, another ten lines, and he memorized basically a, a, a giant poem that he wrote himself. And then as soon as he was out of the gulag, he wrote it down. And he that was the beginning of kind of his uh, literary work. Anyway, he eventually wrote a book called The, the Gulag Archipelago. And uh, many people throughout the Soviet Union sent him their own stories of their experience in the gulag. And he, had, he wrote his own experiences down as well. And it became basically a history book as to what was going on in the gulag. It's also much more than that. He, he shows you the connection in that book between Marx's ideology and what actually took place. Yes? You know why we don't hear about the Gulags as much as the Holocaust? Because our troops didn't move go to Russia and then that's it. That's true. We didn't take out Russia. That's true. So in World War II, we go in and we see the horrors of the Holocaust. Sorry, I'm about to go on a rant. I really don't want to. <laughs> I'm going to. Uh, okay, I can feel it. Okay, so think about this for a second. 
We go into world, we go into Europe into Germany in World War II. We witness the Holocaust and all of its horror, and we say to ourselves, never again. We're never gonna let anything like this happen again. You're right, we didn't witness what was going on in, in the Soviet Union, although many more millions of people died in the Soviet Union than in Germany, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is something people don't realize. Like four times as many. Four five. Maybe. I don't know the exact, but it's many, many more. And when no one knows the exact number because the Soviet Union was doing everything they could to hide it. They burned the records. That's why Solzhenitsyn was so important. He, his writing actually reached the West and depopularized Marx's view. Okay, he was kind of single-handedly. His, his document kind of got smuggled out of the country. You were it was illegal to read in the Soviet Union, but people in the West started reading it and they said, "Oh wow." And their eyes were open to just the atrocities that were taking place. And so, here's the quick rant, okay, you ready? We witness the horrors of the Holocaust and we say, we're never gonna let that happen again. But we're letting it happen right now. Yeah. You guys know about the Uyghur Muslim camps in China? I don't know. All the laws that were canceled in China. Okay. Real quick. It's basically China, which by the way is a communist state, again following Marx, they are in the process of genocide right now. They are killing Muslims. We don't know the exact number right now, but we can see their camps, the children of these parents who are being taken into the camps are being shift into basically orphanages where they're being re-educated to kind of go against everything in their culture. This is a great evil that's taking place right now. We in the West, we're like, eh, whatever. Whatever. Okay, know, right? so it's really frustrating to me how uh, we're allowing stuff like this to happen. But then again, yeah. it happens yeah. here too. Everyone wants to talk about labor camps in North Korea, but you know, North Korea as well. Yeah, media yeah. doesn't cover anything. Yeah, because you can't get information out of China. Well, uh, here's the reason, because China has a lot of money. And, of course, this is saying nothing about the people of China. That they're under, I feel bad for them. They're in a really bad situation, uh, at least many of them. But uh, the communist government regime of China is committing atrocities. And we need to be willing to speak out against that. But too many people are, they like money. Right. They like making money from China, so they yeah. they, they, they hold the time. Anyway, rant over, okay? Rant over. Right. <laughs> but you guys, you do need to be aware of what's going on in the world, okay? Even though it's going to make you infinitely more depressed. So Karl Marx, he's the one that gave that popularized uh, materialist kind of futurism, looking toward this utopian vision among intellectuals, but. Over time, when we saw the results of his philosophy, he became less popular, and for good reason. However, that doesn't mean he's completely irrelevant today. Obviously, there are countries that are still following his philosophy, and uh, people are dying because of it. So, he's the where we were going in materialism. Here's the third one. Oh, yeah. No, I didn't know. You guys have heard of him, Sigmund Freud? Yeah. I forgot where, though. <laughs> I don't think so. Sigmund Freud, he was a famous psychiatrist. Yeah. I don't know where I heard his name. Did yeah, it's not so familiar. Yes. Okay, so he's like a very famous psych psychiatrist in the 1900s. As you can What's see, 1800s and 1900s. He, uh, he's the guy that formulated the idea of the ego and the id and you guys heard of that oh kind of okay so you don't need to worry too much about it but here the main contribution of freud in to popularize materialism is that he he showed people what to do with the guilt that was that they had okay he was a materialist and he thought this guilt it we can uh, basically we can attribute it to certain traumas in our childhood it's not from a creator no, pretty much for rule, like trying to rule out conscience. Yeah. So conch well, that's where it leads, yes. Uh, so he didn't he wanted you he wanted uh, 
Let me just read you a quote here, okay? From Stephen Meyer, writer of one of the books that this class is based on. He said, Darwin told us where we came from, Marx told us where we are going, and Freud told us about human nature and what to do about our guilt. If you get all, if, if the materialistic viewpoint accomplished all three of these things, then what need is there for God, right? So this is where, the, this is how it became popular. And uh, over time, starting really with Darwin and, and into modern day, it became uh, the idea that science and faith are incompatible and enemies of each other has now taken hold and become popular. But we need to understand that that was, that's a, a recent viewpoint, okay? And here's the one more important note, okay? All of this, this materialistic philosophy that, that became so popular, it's all based on one presupposition, that the universe is eternal. Everything that they taught was based on this idea, that the universe is eternal. Yes. Which means, if we can prove that the universe isn't eternal, then it's going to throw a big wrench into, the, into what they believe, right? It's going to throw a big wrench into materialism. So, that's why it's so important. What we've done is we've gone from the 1500s, very obviously a very general overview, from the 1500s to the early 1900s, okay? But the 1900s is where it gets really spicy and interesting, because that's when we started finding in actual evidence that the universe is not eternal. Now what's ironic, I shouldn't say ironic, what's sad is that materialists, even though materialism itself was based on this view that the universe is eternal, materialists have simply shifted gears and tried to go another route. Uh, I, I'm sad, I, I shouldn't have erased it, but they've actually gone back to the other option, which is nothing created everything. Because they can see the universe is not unmade, therefore, uh, the only option was God. No, they don't want that. So. What materialists have done is they now say, okay, somehow nothing created everything. Okay, and that's when you're into, that's what's really sad about materialism today, okay? At least materialism back then had uh, made sense logically, right? It doesn't anymore. And we'll talk about that in more detail next time. Any questions, comments? Yeah.